Hello, and welcome to this podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Dean Bubbly, founder of Disruptive Analysis, a technology consulting firm based in London. Dean is known as a visionary in the telecoms and more generally connectivity sectors, and is therefore a frequent speaker at major conferences on these topics, as well as a source of quotes and contributions for publications such as The Economist, The Financial Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Dean's clients include many of the world's leading telecom operators, vendors, regulators, and industry associations. Okay, Dean, you know about your challenge. Telling us what, if anything, is wrong with the European Commission consultation on the future of telecoms and connectivity. Hi, and thank you very much for the invitation, Caroline. So I'm, I'm Dean Bobley. My, my Twitter handle is Disruptive Dean, which should give you an idea of uh, the fact that I, I do occasionally like to stress test things by throwing rocks at them. And I, I, I've been already fairly critical um, of a lot of the discussion around the so-called fair contribution debate, which I think is anything but fair in the way that it's been framed. Uh, and so I've had a look with interest at the European Commission's um, recent consultation and survey. And yeah, there, there are a few observations that I would make. I mean, the first is, it's, it's obviously it's in multiple sections. Some of it is about the future of the te uh, telecoms industry. And th there's some interesting questions in there about the role of traditional telcos and new entrants and private networks and infrastructure companies like tower companies. So, so it's, that asks some of the good or appropriate contextualization uh, questions. But to be honest, I think the upfront sections are largely a fig leaf for the section four, which is specifically about the costs and contribution discussion. Uh, and I think the, you, know, you can almost like look at the, the first sections almost as a response to some of the criticism uh, and it, it sort of makes it look as if it's um, you know, pretending to have a, a wider use. Or if I'm generous, perhaps they realize that they've, they've gone down the wrong path and they're trying to salvage something from it, uh, if I'm being generous. But if I drill into the, um, the section on um, you know, the traffic uh, on networks, on the costs from it. Firstly, the numbers and the data that they're looking for are incredibly detailed and the definitions are incredibly poor. So, for example, on the section on uh, network infrastructure costs, he uses a very strange phrase of network infrastructure capable of optimizing traffic. Now, I don't know, you know what that especially means, whether they phrase that to focus on active parts of the network rather than things like you know, towers and concrete and civil works and ducts and so on, or if it's supposed to be talking about you know, the real sort of control layer like deep packet inspection, because something like a fiber um, isn't capable on its own of optimizing traffic. So I'm a little bit confused about the definitions. The other thing that it's, it's um, poor at is um, yeah, the assumptions around um, the, the, there's no, there's no. It essentially assumes that increases in data traffic implicitly mean increases in costs, and and, and that largely isn't true, especially on fixed networks and to a large degree on mobile. A lot of the costs are about coverage, um, not incremental capacity, and, and it's very inconsistent about where it uses words like uh, incremental uh, costs, and it doesn't bother to define those uh, as well. Also, the period over which the, um, the questions ask about costs and traffic, it spans an interesting period in the telecoms industry, not just the pandemic over the last few years, but also a period in which a lot of operators have um, spun out or sold off parts of their infrastructure. And so the direct investment that an operator might have made a few years ago perhaps won't be made over the next few years because they've spun out their tower businesses and they've gone from a CapEx model to an OpEx model. Or the same thing in, in fiber, maybe they have a wholesale arrangement with other providers. Uh, and so I think that you know, the, the, whether any of the statistics are like for like comparable is highly doubtful. Um, and, and the other thing that is, it, the whole thing seems to be an exercise in, in there's a logical fallacy called begging the question. Um, which essentially is almost like assuming the answer. Um, and so there's a lot of questions about how much are costs going up because of all the content traffic, for example, which firstly assumes that content or traffic will grow. It assumes that will drive costs or incremental costs. Um, and it doesn't bother to drill into, for example, where that traffic is being used. Is it on, an, on the best network? So if people are in indoors rather than outdoors, and if you're trying to run 5G through a brick wall or concrete, that's going to cost extra money or it's not going to work very well. 
Um, so I, I, I would say that it's not been a particularly well constructed questionnaire. It's very much targeted at traditional telcos rather than, for example, MVNOs or um, alternative network operators. In some countries like UK and Germany, there's a um, obviously UK, not in the EU, Germany is a lot of investment in new fiber, what are called alt nets, who obviously appear to have a business model for building out fiber, or else they wouldn't have got funding uh, over the last couple of years. So I think that, that overall, you know, it looks to me as if it's it's designed to come up with um, a big trawl of, of data. There might be something useful. How much of it is comparable between uh, questionnaire respondents or over time is highly debatable. Um, and I, to me, it looks a little bit like the, they're trying to ha look a, as if they're collecting enough information to justify a policy they already half decided on. Or perhaps with the upfront sections, being generous, maybe they're looking at some bigger picture things and they're going to quietly sideline um, the, uh, the cost recovery argument if they can't manage to support it after all. Dean, it's, it's, it's actually um, quite useful and, and I like the fact that you went into the detail of, of pointing out that um, um, important terminology in the consultation is not clarified, so that means that people will respond thinking about different things. Uh, which makes the responses obviously difficult to 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 then aggregate as oh wow. those people were talking about this and and yes as as someone who who worked for infrastructure providers the optimi optimization of fiber is is a new concept to me <laughs> I, I, exactly and there's the phrases as well like data generators now I, I don't know for example we're we're talking on um a, a, a video conferencing platform which may well be hosted on Amazon AWS, in which case, is, who's generating that traffic? Is it me and you? Is it the video conferencing company? Is it Amazon or, or for that matter, Azure or Google or anyone else? Um, you, know, you double count it all? You know, I mean, half the, 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 the traffic on YouTube, you know, we famously, we have this term user-generated content. Mm, yes. um, is the user the generator or is it YouTube? Well, one, one, one would consider that if the commission in its uh, legislative instruments talks about user-generated content on, on YouTube, let's assume the generation comes from there. Then. <laughs> well, exactly. And, and, you know, and, and also the way the internet works is that, that Netflix doesn't generate traffic, I request it. Now, there's a little bit of stuff, which is things like if I get, if I get adverts pushed to me or there's an autoplay function on a web page or I've clicked the button for auto-update my uh, operating software, fair enough, right? That is pushed. But the rest of it is I decide to sit down and watch a movie and maybe I get it from Netflix or maybe I get it from brand X video streaming company. But the bottom is you know, I'm sitting on the sofa for two hours consuming the same number of megabytes. It doesn't really make any difference who it comes from. Well, th thank you for those remarks, Dean. I think uh, maybe you should send an email to the Commission suggesting that they put a glossary uh, <laughs> next to the consultation. That might help people to respond to the same question <laughs> and not have well, to yeah. interpret what, what, it, what it's about. And uh, I guess we'll see what comes out of this wonderful consultation. I'm an optimist, so I'll go for your um, um, perspective on maybe something good will come out of this in terms of the broader perspective uh, and maybe some of the less useful plans uh, will be dropped uh, along the way. Uh, yeah, and I, I haven't even got to mention this, the questions on spectrum policy, but we, maybe that's for another day. Okay, let's let's do that another another time. Or if you're doing a blog about it, please let us know and we'll make sure to make noise about it because uh, it's always interesting to to read what you write about about this because okay. it delves um deeper into the issue that we in the brussels bubble uh can can do thank you dean have a great day <laughs>